Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, the keynote reading for the first weekend of Culturama, featuring Liz Gonzalez and Lynn Tom Thompson. Um, I'm just so glad to have both of, the, both of you here, two of my favorite poets, two, both from the, the Southern California area. And I'm so glad to have an IE poet here as well to represent uh, this wonderful cultural space that we have. Um, I think we're at, we'll have uh, Liz Gonzalez go first and then Lynn Thompson. And then if there is time for questions, we'll take whatever questions you have for them. So let me introduce Liz. Uh, Liz Gonzalez is the author of Dancing in the Santa Ana Winds Poems y Cuentos New and Selected. Uh, recent work appears or is forthcoming in Poets and Writers, the International Literary Quarterly, the anthology San Bernardino Singing. She teaches creative writing at the UCLA Extension Writers Program a fourth generation Southern California. She grew up in San, the San Bernardino Valley and currently lives in Long Beach. So, Liz Gonzalez. Hi everyone, so happy to be here. Hi, um, so I'm gonna start by reading a, a, a last few paragraphs from an essay in my book, Dancing in the Santa Ana Winds. It, and the essay has the same title, Dancing in the Santa Ana Winds. And since we're so windy here, I thought I would start with uh, this piece. Most everything dances in the Santa Anas. Bunches of purple needle gl grass glimmering on hillsides bend in a sideway mountain yoga pose. Dried sycamore leaves get dragged over sidewalks. Their tips scratch the cement like claws. Palm tree fronds thrash like die hard headbangers. Freed tumbleweeds bounce across streets with reckless abandon. It's a bougainvillea petals. Is reading in, but not she's not the first read. Hello. I, I'm sorry. I, I muted the people. Okay. Uh, background noise. Yeah. Bougainvillea petals and camellia blossoms fly off branches and scatter across the lawn like confetti bursting from cracked cascarones at an Easter celebration. When the Santa Anas have mellowed, some of us head to one of the nearby hiking trails. At the top of the hill, we pause and inhale deep the clear view of mountains, high rises, and Pacific Ocean, Southern California in all its glory. So I can't see you because I am reading from my computer. Um, so if something happens, yeah, let me know. <laughs> You'll have to unmute and let me know, John, please. A rose red as, a san as sangria for mama on her 80th birthday. She chasses in a cha-cha rhythm to Santana's smooth guitar riff. Her scarlet lined black lace flamenco gown sways with her curves. Twirls flutter the flounces on her skirt like fans on a summer day in Sevilla. A rose red as sangria adorns her chignon, whispers in a, an incantation. Listen close, the click of her tongue keeps time with the beat. This isn't 80 is the new 40. This is Dorothy today. Wife, mama, grandma, great grandma, a badass former single mother of four daughters who bought a home without a co-signer or child support. Siren, lover, woman. She persevered long before the hashtag. The band plays her favorite Selena Cumbia. Clear some space. Dorothy's going to get her groove on. That's my mama. First on the dance floor, last to leave. Forever young in bloom.
And this next one, um, well, I'm reading some uh, more uh, jubilant poems, and then I'm going to read one poem that isn't as jubilant, and then I'll read from my book. My backyard garden office. The camellias and bougainvillea came with the house, giving me a head start. First, we planted the nopal in honor of grandma's cactus garden that I saw only in a photograph. By the time I was born, she cooked with nopalitos from a jar. Next, a row of roses, dainty white, joyful nectarine, optimistic yellow, and fragrant lavender. A reminiscence of the roses that greeted us on the walkway to grandma's front door. Then a Meyer lemon and an orange tree to bring San Bernardino Valley citrus scents back to me. When the weather is right, I unfold the beach lounger beneath palm fronds and read or ruminate. I write on the patio surrounded by potted plants, jade I cut from grandma's yard decades ago, black zortkop, aloe vera, and ferns. Nearby, my torty cat pounces on a grasshopper. A bee chases a monarch off milkweed blooms. And in Allen's hummingbird, that copper orange flame perched on a power line, plummets to the Mexican sage's purple velvet spikes. My writing process is like my gardening, deadhead the roses to spark new buds, leave some leaves in the beds to nurture the soil, and weed with hand tools, the fork puller and claws, not toxic spray, dig deep when transplanting succulents so they root and thrive, harvest prickly pears and lemons late enough to ripen, but early enough before they rot. Search for bird's nest before trimming the camellias. With the trowel, lopper, and pruner, create arrangements, refresh lines, and cultivate joy. My backyard garden, where grandma's nopal writes odes to the sky, and my palabras push upward from the soil and unfurl in the sunlight. And I'm thankful to um, some people who are here today who participated in uh, Women's Write-In, which is uh, we meet um, well, we were meeting, we've, we've, since the, the pandemic, we changed the schedule a bit, but um, Stephanie gave me feedback on that piece, and I think Marianne did too, so if you recognize that piece I just read, that's, that's it, and this piece I wrote, um, I uh, have chronic migraines, and a lot of people don't understand migraines. And so they would tell me, oh, yeah, I had one of those. I had to take an Excedrin. And I wish I could take an Excedrin and it would get rid of my migraine. So I wrote this piece in the hope that more people would understand what migraines are, because I think it's one of the more misunderstood ailments. Ritual for cold human, humid mornings. The rain cloud swelling inside your skull wakes you before the alarm. Breathe, unclench your jaw, slip your fingers under the fleece beanie and rub the tender spot on your scalp. Pop one OTC anodyne. Pray you won't need more. Finish the glass of water on the nightstand. Slow motion shuffle to the kitchen for a migraine antidote breakfast. A jumbo cup of half-calf, half-decaf instant coffee. 
inhale the steam to melt the mist in your head. Stir blueberries, walnuts, and chia seeds into a bowl of goat yogurt. Swallow two turmeric capsules. The TV's hum soothes as you breathe, unclench, rub, and wait for the sun to vaporize the gloom. Finally, the ache shrinks enough so you can get dressed, feed the pets, make the bed, wash the dishes. By noon, you roll out the Prince Purple yoga mat on the strip of weed lawn between the palm fronds flapping like crows and the bed of yellow, sunset orange, and aromatic lavender roses. Bees buzz around the blossoms, too busy powdering themselves to bother with you. Breathe, unclench, Stretch into downward dog, careful not to kick the torty cat crouched on the edge of the mat. Warn the swallowtails and painted ladies sailing above to stay out of the range of her leap. Today is a good day. No need for the pill that traps you in a shadow or worse, the self-administered injection that makes you seasick. No lady of Shalott locked inside your home. Your head allows you to rise without whirling. Take the dog for a walk to the hilltop. Weave a story or poem. Turn up the funk and dance. Enjoy this lull while you can. Tomorrow's forecast threatens fog thick as a curse, the kind that pulls a spiked rope taut from your left temple to your left trapezius, stranding you on the mattress for days. So now I'm going to read a few pieces from my book. What did I do? Oh, there. And um, thank you for listening. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite pieces in, in my book, Dancing in the Santa Ana Winds. Um, the summer, be oh, and so just to introduce it, um, it's the summer before ninth grade, but I got a job through manpowers as i had said in my poem about my mother she was a single mom and so it was a special program for low income teens to get a summer job and that's how i got this job the summer before ninth grade before i lassoed my first tongue kiss and my long-haired boyfriend ignored me in science class the next day before I ran for Valentine's Queen against my ex-best friend and we broke out flailing chihuahua claws, yanking hair, yelping cuss words in front of the principal's office, I woke to the trill of tin bells strapped on two-inch suede platforms, clonked four and a half long blocks through heat waves rising from the sidewalks, held down my neon orange and lime miniskirt and climbed the bus headed for the San Bernardino main library. The click and slide of card catalogs played funkier grooves than Tower of Powers bump city. Crackling book spines engraved with golden curly cues excited me more than a boy girl pool party. I couldn't wait to plunge the crinkled pages inside. All morning, I squeezed hardbacks between dewy decimal neighbors, helped text hunters explore shelves. Whenever the mean librarian couldn't see me behind the oversized section, I snuck a read. 
on scorching afternoon rides home, books pointing out of my backpack like a fisherman's net after a good day's catch. I made a pit stop at Esperanza Market on Mount Vernon Avenue where the butcher wrapped up a pickled pig's foot for me. With my legs sweat stuck to the plastic bench seat, I gnawed that pata to the bone, cooled off with Robert Frost poems. The bus slanted up Fifth Street to Foothill while I dove deep into songs of tinkling brooks and leafless woods until my stop at the bench on Meridian Avenue. I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. Thank you so much. Okay, Thank that was wonderful. Uh, I'm about to introduce Lynn Freed, I'm sorry, Lynn Thompson. Um, and, but before I do, I wanted to tell you about something that's happening this week. I'm just gonna share my, my screen. We are gonna have uh, Sandra Cisneros come and speak at Mount Sac. Oh, that's and fabulous. That's going to be wonderful, absolutely. She's going to be here on November twelfth, and it's from four to five thirty. I'll put this on our, our website, and I'll, I'll I'll send this out to you. And she's just here to talk to to, to who shows up. Uh, yeah, she, she's one of my favorite. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I'm so thrilled to have. Lynn Thompson with us today. She's one of my favorite poets. And I was, I was lucky enough to have her. She actually came to my class this year, the, the magic of, um, of Zoom, right? And my students were able to talk to her directly and they, they, they can't stop talking about that. Um, anyway, uh, Lynn Thompson is the author of Start With a Small Guitar and Beg No Pardon, winner of the Great Lakes Colleges Association uh, New Writers Award. Her latest manuscript, Fretwork, won the 2018 Marshall Hark Press Poetry Prize and was published in 2019. Her, her recent work appears or is forthcoming in Poetry, Plowshares, Colorado Review, New England Review, and Barrow Street. So, Lynn. Thank you so much, John. It's such a treat to be here and see so many faces that I know and see some new faces. Um, I particularly want to thank Yvonne for um, doing the ASL for us and say how what a treat it is to read with my friend Liz. She's, she's always wonderful to read with. So this is, this is a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to start with a few poems from Fretwork. Um, I think Stephanie would kill me if I didn't. And um, the book is primarily, it's got a couple of themes, but family is the big theme. And within that, poems about adoption, and I'm going to read primarily a few of those. This first is composition number one. If I say the woman who birthed me betrayed me, you may think that woman badly distilled, needful. But if I say she who betrayed me was herself betrayed, you may think of the woman as gesture, exile, spilled out. Because when we think of exile or the innocent gesture, if there's any such thing as a gesture that's innocent, we should also think intolerable music. We should also think intolerable mirror, the mirror never reflecting that it could become obsession or that it might perhaps just peel away. If I say peel or blunder or mercy, you might think my vision too fragile and you're half right. From somewhere unbidden, the woman waylaid by my birth whistles. Here's a swain bridge. Cross over. Compose the dark. While she was out stealing, I slept in Beverly's womb but it was dark and I did not go far. She smelled the way the Taj Mahal smells by moonlight. Minutes went by on tiptoe with their fingers to their lips. Then her hands dropped and jerked at something and the robe she was wearing came open, but it was dark and I did not go far. She was thinking and it was clear even on such short acquaintance, 
thinking was always going to be a bother to her. Minutes went by on tiptoe with their fingers to their lips. From 30 feet away, she looked like a lot of class, enough woman to make a priest discard his vestments. But it was dark and I did not go far. She smiled a smile I felt in my hip pocket. She made me a pawn to her indifference then, but it was dark and I did not go far. Minutes went by on tiptoe with their fingers to their lips. Carnival, one, forget the birth thing, forget about her. She was a beauty or she wasn't. She spoke softly or laughed like a man who slugs five fingers of whiskey every day. She loved a carnival, but only when it came to town. She had a hunger for the short, short story and asked for everything that happened, then put it behind her as soon as. Forget this irrelevant history. Can anyone know what's true? Two, forget the planet is spinning so hard you can't call it anything but memory. You've already forgotten first memories, how they half skip, won't speak. And you've, and you've already forgotten your father. Maybe he was a rogue or believed in holy, holy, but no matter. Every day he was, he wasn't. A blessing. Three. Forget you slipped beyond your mother's wide hips after waiting to forget. The hugger-mugger of the coming through. The sisters forgetting to cross their foreheads. Forget the insignificant chance. The burr. Be of rare cheer and don't be fooled. The carnival lasts only minutes. Don't forget your mask. Um, and then two more from this book. This is to the child or children I didn't have. Thorn. Dear Stinky Bottom. Oh, could have been so long and such never becoming. So dear, you could have been my split from a roundabout. Instead, I have labeled you Thorn. Think of all that's been spared you, the ferocity, of me as mother, all civil disobedience and swollen nipples, using you to justify my, select any neurosis and insert here, my finite dis-ease hidden under a false veneer of, trust me, a flim-flam ma'am of the first order saying, because I say so, you are so lucky, little feet tender as lamb skin, gurgle of giggle, my little trevi fountain, just think of the cruelty that was my mother, shrunk, wrapped, set upon by the curse of wanting under the thumb of the great thumb. Here, read auntie, priest, flu epidemic, and hardly a penny to give thanks for. Deep shadow under my breast, be grateful wherever you are. For wherever you are isn't as dark as the miasma you would have lived in, so be glad my seed of perpetual dominion. And uh, this is the penultimate poem in the book, uh, The Mollusk Museum. One, family. Is or is not a velveteen pillow. Theater, a dinner hour mistake with candied yams on the side. A box at the bottom of Flightless penguins hitchhiking through town. Footprints in a cemetery. Two, symmetry. Two moon pies per gypsy. Greedy art and dirigible need. Rushes and reeds. Tracing paper on papyrus. The solo, the ensemble. Wood ticks, wax moths. Hand drum thrum thrumming the hand. A river, a poplar, the same old questions. Three, war. 
I come to struggle, to eat the edges of, to abrade the chemical and the all chemical in the falling night. Always a souvenir wrapped in a rigmarole, Vivaldi versus Jay-Z. I'm wrapped in biblical passages, but never in any book of revelations or Koran or Green Hornet. All is taboo. Every day is like any other habit. A telegram never opened. So that's a little, little taste of fretwork. And then I thought I would um, read some newer pieces. Um, I'm still changing them at the last minute. Um, you know, you think you're done with themes, but then you're never really done with them. I thought after Fred work, I would never write any of the adoption poems or displacement poems, but no. Separate, separate. She conjured me as adjective before she verbed me. All disconnected, placenta notwithstanding. As discreet, thinking I would never tell as distinct in the way the outlines drawn around a victim of mayhem are distinct, as freestanding, but who among my kinfolk was ever truly free? Or maybe my first mother just chose to disentangle, sever my limbs from her torso, to sunder, let go, let God, that bitch. See, literature and law, how they enshrine dichotomy, a separate piece, separate but equal. While some musicians propose a different riddle, see a tribe called quests separate together where we stand great among creation. The process of bringing someone into existence, the polar opposite of unmaking by separation. The etymology made manifest circa 1425, just about the time the Portuguese began to traffic in snatching the fula, the wolof, asleep in the teal. Is this how the art of our disjoining became so popular? That now it's not extraordinary to remove pearls from their oyster, to poach any elephant's tusk for the ivory. Um, and this one um, recently just appeared in a new journal. I urge you all to look for it. It's a Southern California journal out of SC called Air Light. Big thanks to David Ulin for, for taking this poem for publication. It honors the wonderful poet Yusef Komanyaka. Three quarter jazz. I am subsumed by how it horns into obsidian and how it's held up ever captive on the streets where Coltrane still lives. I love the teak and teak and teak of it, the hand drum that recognizes me dark. I adore my ebony as it strides the F key in Latif's flute and my 10 toes coal colored can outwit every liar as well as dirigididus of Aborigines, coupling jet and the raven a go-go bell. I'm sable and magical powers and exhaust at least 100 symbols. So that poem is a lesson in, don't put these words in that you can't really read very well because you stumble every time you say them. <laughs> um, this poem um, takes the uh, titles of the paintings and artwork of the wonderful artist, Betty Saar and weaves them into an assemblage, which is the type of artwork that she does, uh, assemblage. I was born from the time in between in the house of tarot, born of Our Lady of the Shadows and I have survived 10 secret mojos. I got a conjure bag, got good luck tokens, some herbs. I know how to catch a unicorn because I am a spirit catcher. I am not the high priestess, but I have a view from a sorcerer's window, and I have never belonged to the black cross in the white section only. I am not one of those midnight Madonnas, but neither am I a rainbow babe in the woods. Sometimes I dream about my grandmother's house when it was Indigo Mercy, 
was she bequeathed me her house of the open hand so I wouldn't live anyone's imitation of life so I could live as lullaby or Sheba, red bone and black crossing. Uh, thank you. Just a few more. Um, stones. After hours of hauling stones, I want to be touched. The stones I carry are igneous, metamorphic, are limestone, granite, conglomerate, coal, yet you say you don't believe I've hauled Earth's outer layer, its crust cake, because you think a rock is a rock, is mineraloid matter. What is that you carry? Water? Weight? And after, what is it you wanted that you want still? I wanted, once, thought it would panacea, thought it would be original color, rust of shack torn down, blue oyster, would smell more piquant than a nuclear blast. But I am Mary Contrary and we are all the worst for fairy tales. I want to be touched on shin, on cheek, on small of back, past tension, or if there is no mercy, there'll be hours of hauling stones, of unwanting, neither marble nor caress, only lava, cooling. Um, three more, I think I, I'm, I'm good for time, John. Yeah, thank you. So this poem, Unfolding Blue, is comes out of an exercise that I've, I've shared with others and that I like to fool with when I can't think of anything to write. And that is find yourself a good title, either one of your own or somebody else's, and write a poem using only the letters in that title, no other letters. So you've really kind of given yourself a little assignment. So this one is called Unfolding Blue. Begun in fondling, begun benign, of loin unbid, of foe unbound, of bold, of fuel, fouled, foiled, fugue, and fine. No lean, no goblin, in union unled, in bed unblind. Golden I boil, indulge, unbend, unboned, blue fin. So that was just something to have fun with. This one is also a cento where I went back and used the lines of Langston Hughes. You might know that a cento is a recombining of the lines of either a single poet or you can do it with a group of poets. These are all uh, Langston Hughes. Langston won't stay in his grave. Calls me rose of neon darkness. Calls himself early blue evening, black smoke of sound, says we are related, you and I. Reminds me we are wandering in the dusk, our faces a chocolate bar, facing the night of two moons. And though I'm a lonely little question mark, he laughs. Life is for the living with gypsies and sailors. Till the old junk man death plants your toes in the cool swamp mud, shake your brown feet, honey. Wander through this living world. Get out the lunchbox of your dreams. Stay awake all night with loving or be a woman in the doorway. Death don't ring no doorbells or say, here is that sleeping place as if it were some noble thing. Think how thin and sharp the moon is tonight. Don't mind dying veiling what darkness hides, haunt like mystery, like a naked bone in gumbo, nod at the sun. Um, thank you. And I'd like to close with this one because I don't know about you, but watching um, Kamala Harris last night, I was just all boo-hooey and you know, um, just kind of hard to believe. 
Um, and I really loved it when she said that she knew that she stood on the shoulders of others. So I had not planned to read this, but I swapped out some other things to read this poem that is about Harriet Tubman. It's called Swing Low Free. And I should tell you as you're visualizing this that it's based on a sculpture that was done by Alison Saar, the daughter of Betty Saar, who I referred to earlier, who's a good friend and who was kind enough to give me the artwork that uh, is on the cover of Fretwork. Swing low, free. As scout and spy, nurse and train, swing low. I went back south over and over and brought them out. Massa Brodus tried to sell me. He failed. I turned runaway after fled north and flaunted rules men made to foil our liberty, led my kin, ma and pa, from the land of black-eyed Susans. I could not save all who bled my blood, but I led multitudes from Bucktown to Cambridge, Camden to Blackbird, trusted in Bakongo Mojo, in Kizi Makalo relied on Hosa charms and the Ebo's blue and white codes hung from oaks, on doors, on countless quilts along the way. Their patterns steering us north by stitch, shoe fly, log cabin, bear's paw, wagon wheel, sweet swinging from porticos in Dover, in Smyrna and Odessa, our field guides to the chop tank River, a cipher of bedclothes draped for an uppity Moses. Oh, sweet chariot, I would live free or die. When I took the freedom and looked at my hands, I knew I had to be the same breaker of laws in Newcastle and Wilmington, Chester County and beyond, where I brought them up, brought them out to the eastern shore where a mighty Jehovah was troubling the waters of slaveholders who named me Araminta, slave drivers who put a bounty on my head. Descended from Ashanti, I remembered Anansi, West Africa's trickster, followed the drinking gourd and stole away to Jesus on Whirlpool Bridge, Canada, where I looked over Jordan. I had help. Fred Douglas and William Still and many Quakers who were almost as good as colored and could be trusted every time to burn bright the candlelight in their garrets. Always I went back, died March 10th, crossed over free. Today I am lauded and immortal, roots of struggle stitched on my bustle, faces of unnamed risk takers tatted on the skirt of a scout, spy, nurse, train, a woman singing, we mean to live free. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That, those were those wonderful reading. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we, thank you so much. We, we have um, time for questions if anybody has questions. I'm sure both on how to how to create um, what 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 they're what they're trying to do with their careers and what they're trying to tell us. Um, any questions you have? Actually, sure. I have a question uh, for Lynn. Uh, oh, my camera's off. I'm sorry. Um, hi, Kim. Hi. Uh, so uh, I was one of the things i was noticing when i was listening to your poetry just now is you have a very strong sense of uh sound and rhyme there's um and, and is that there, uh, that appears to be something you do very intentionally and how do you go about settling on a particular sound like in the i believe it was the last poem i noticed a lot of h yeah yeah, going on there. And uh, do you just pick one and go with it? Or is there some guiding principle that you use for that? Um, you know, I, 
people have referenced that before that there's a lot of musicality in in my work and that comes from rhyme or repetition i i always like to tell people i was i was raised on jazz rock and roll in the american musical theater and mm -hmm. i think those cadences are always in my head um but i think the way it really comes about is i never consider a poem done until i read it aloud and sometimes i tape it just to see how the sounds are working Nice. And that's like the last piece of the puzzle to try to get that musicality because I think that's what contributes if the poem is, is any good to it staying in someone's head. They can actually hear the music of the line. Um, but I, I wish I did have a, a better secret to share, but that's that's about it. Just reading it to make sure no, that's that, huge. that the music really comes through. And it makes it easier to read, I think, in a reading like this if it's got a, a certain rhythm to it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, I, I've got a question for, for Liz. And I've just been I've just been thinking about the Inland Empire for so long. And I'm I'm wondering how it it it's if it's gotten down into your voice, into your everything you do, the way you think, that sort of thing. And if so, if that appears in your poetry. Although you're out of the IE now. Right. I'm out of there, but my family still lives there. So mm. I'm there often and I have good friends who live there. And um, so, um, uh, yeah. Can you explain what you mean, what you mean by the first part of your question? Well, you know, I, I, when I, when I leave California, there's something Californian in my voice. Right. And when I, there, there, there is a, a regional sense to, to a lot of poetry. And we, I, I don't know, you, you have a sense of what that means when you're talking about New York, but I, the IE is kind of a forgotten place. And I'm, I'm wondering if there is a regional kind of distinction that we can make the uh, regionalism in our voice. Hmm. Hmm. Boy, I can't answer that question well, except I think that, um, what you might choose to write about will be in there, what you focus on. And um, I, for me, what happened was that I was writing poems and then when, when uh, my publisher asked me if I had a manuscript, which I did not, I put my work together and realized that a lot of my work was um, uh, based in the Inland Empire, San Bernardino Valley, uh, mostly. And, um, and so it, you know, uh, being, uh, having the experience of growing up with the Santa Ana winds was a huge impact nature, the nature that was around, looking at those mountains, that crown of mountains every day was deaf is definitely informs my work. Um, I don't know if there's a regional voice because we're so diverse there. Like, I don't think there's a regional LA voice. Mm -hmm. There might be different pockets. I, I agree, Liz, I think that's true. It's, it's it, the, the geography may infu infuse it, but in terms of a specific voice, I think that I would agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? That there is or is not a regional voice? Yeah, that there's not. I, I do think, um, I don't know as much about the Inland Empire, um, but I suspect that it's similar in that we have just so many voices that all of those voices start to ring in your head. You know, I got a Jewish deli on one side and a, my favorite, uh, Mexican taqueria and my favorite sushi place. And I think all of that subtly informs what you're doing. Um, but in terms of just one voice, I, I personally, I mean, I think of myself very much as, as a Angelino, but I'm not sure that it shows up as a voice as much as a place in my work. Uh -huh. the, free, the freeway's in there a lot. You can't avoid putting the freeway in if you're in Southern California, <laughs> um, uh, that sort of thing. But I, I think it's hard to have one voice other than the voice that is your voice. I think people have told me, I can kind of tell now if it's a Lynn poem or not. Okay. 
I, I have a question from Kelsey uh, for both of you. What are some of the tools or processes that you, you, that you use to edit your work? You go, Liz. <laughs> well, um, I like to read my work aloud. And I also have a workshop group that I work with and they challenge me um, uh, to, to make my work even better. Um, I like to, uh, uh, sometimes when a line, like it's bothering me, I can't get the words right. I can't get the music right. So I play around, like I'll go in the, you know, on word and I'll put, I'll make the lines long. I'll make them really short. I'll, you know, I change it up to see how, how they sound, to find what it is that the poem is missing. And with, with um, I also write prose and I actually was gonna read a, a, a personal, a short a nonfiction, flash nonfiction piece. And my, my, uh, my process is different for that. But I, I like to free write first, always. I always love to just free write without worrying, you know, just getting the ideas out and without worrying about finding the right words, without worrying about line breaks or anything like that, just get it all out. I'd say I have a, a similar process. I used to uh, try to compose everything in the computer and I think I was limiting myself and this doesn't go so much to editing. I'll get to that in a minute, but I like that idea of just getting everything out. And so now a lot of times I'll just journal something out margin to margin and kind of think of myself as a sculptor coming to it later. Does it, does it want to be quatrains? Does it want to be a prose poem? Am I onto something and maybe using a, you know, a, a pantoum form or a villanelle form? Um, and I, I try to still take as many workshops from writers I admire um, as possible to learn their tricks. So a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was even last weekend, there was a workshop with Carl Phillips. And one of the things he talked about was take your poem, it's not working or you're not sure or whatever, write it from the bottom up and see what happens. Um, which I hadn't really, I mean, it's not that, a shocking idea, but I hadn't thought of it before. And it does take you in an interesting direction. I try to go back for my, the two things I really try to do is there's certain words I know I like to use. If I use that one more time, I'm just gonna hang myself. Um, so I go back and try to take out all the vats because they're just naturally in there. And then I ask literally every word, is there a better word? Is there a more unusual word? Is there something that evokes scent or color or whatever. Um, so I really interrogate, try to interrogate every single word, including the articles, um, the mm. prepositions, everything, to try to see, am I saying it in the freshest way? Okay, we have a question from Michelle uh, uh, for Liz. And she says, Liz, you take many walks along the ocean and trails. How much does your walks with Chaco and your husband figure into your poetry? Oh, definitely place. Um, also, just just percolating work uh, that that goes in there. Chacho plays a role in some of my my work. Um, I think getting out and about is one of the best things that you can do for your writing because it gives you, you pay attention with your senses and beyond sight. And it gives you, you know, you observe and it gives you images and um, ideas to write about and let your mind roam and just taking in what you see and hear is, yeah, definitely. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. I think so too. I think it is. Do, do we have any final questions? Can I ask Yvonne a question? I see she has her, her sound off. Um, I just want to know how difficult it is to interpret poetry. Mm -hmm. Because it's not always, you know, linear. It's not always, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's got just an image stuck in the middle of a sentence. And so I'm just curious. 
So see, I, so I, you, yeah. You're muted. You're muted. I was clarifying, um, as interpreters, we usually don't participate in any of this kind of stuff. Um, so I wanted to get clarification and approval from our client um, to make sure that it was okay for me to answer. Um, sure. I've been interpreting John's class for a while um, and that any poetry always has additional challenges with often double meanings. Um, right. For example, I know you referenced Moses, which I know um, is one thing that has multiple meanings within the black community. So right. to stay with um, the content plus the feel plus there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, so really my goal with interpreting poetry tends to be more affect um, and what is the actual meaning behind things. Right, well, I appreciate it. I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much. I can yeah. say that, that uh, Yvonne was, was specifically chosen for my class because it's hard to do poetry and she's, she's very good at it. Uh, so I, I'm, I was just thrilled to see her here today. Well, I wanna thank Yvonne and Rudy for interpreting that was, thank you so much. Okay, um, so I think that's great. I think that's a, that's a wonderful way to, to, to end. Thank you so much, both of you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Yeah. It was good to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It's really wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. So we have had three days of literature and the arts uh, and that's just the beginning. We'll be back next Friday at 9 a.m. And I hope you, you're there with us.